machine learning, deep learning, also has expert knowledge in Hadoop, MapReduce, and etc. He is a senior technologist with strong business acumen and technical experience in IT and big data, cloud computing. He is a member of architecture committee and also possesses excellent for project and interpersonal skills. He enjoys being a team member as well as taking leadership and lead the multiple teams of employees. And thank you, sir, for being with us today. Thank you, Shantilato. Yeah, thank, thank you, madam, for a brief introduction of the speakers today. And I have a few announcements to be made for all the participants. So I request all the participants to mute yourself and turn off your video for the better streaming. And post your question in the chat window. And uh, during the Q&A session, few questions will be selected after his talk. And feedback link will be shared during the Q&A session. And uh, you have to be careful while entering your name because the same thing will be used for preparing the certificates. And now I hand over the session to Mr. Naveen. So. Thank you, Sandeep Shantilata. I appreciate uh, the introduction. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to check and see if you guys can hear me fine. Yes, yes, we, we can. Yes, Great. Audible. Great. Sandeep, would you like to make me the presenter? Yeah, yeah. Can you start now? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. Once again, I request everyone to be in a, a mute mode. And uh, if you have any questions, please put your questions in the chat window. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. So. Can you guys see my screen? Could uh, one of you verify that for me? Maybe type in a chat window. If it is yes, can you type in yes? Great. And uh, let me bring up my presentation. Hope you can see my presentation now. One more time, just give me a yes, guys. Great. Thank you, Manju. OK, so gentlemen, ladies, um, it's a pleasure joining Sandeep, Mr. Sandeep, and Anurag University in this uh, uh, in this meeting, and I appreciate the opportunity. And my sincere apologies. Um, uh, we had uh, run into some unexpected technical issue. Mr. Mr. Sandeep has done his due diligence in the afternoon, and uh, he has tested it uh, successfully. But unfortunately, we ran into this one, and again, fortunately, we were able to resolve that. So my sincere apologies one more time for uh, taking up your time, guys, OK? Um, so let's get started here, guys. Now, today, let me start with a quick story or a scenario. And then we'll get into some of the aspects of the big data and uh, how it, uh, uh, you know, how this could be of uh, use to you and how it could add value into some of the things uh, uh, is what we'll try to understand. And I hope I can uh, deliver a bit of it, guys, OK? So I'm going to start with a story or a scenario. Imagine Lucy. Lucy is working in a retail store. And uh, she's a data scientist. The retail uh, store sells a lot of um, items, appliances, electronics, computers, etc. They have about 700 stores and 120 orders and uh, pickup points. Stores is stores. Order and pickup points is where you place the orders and where you pick up the you know the items and things like that <clears throat> um, they <clears throat> analyze 1.5 million POS transactions 420 product groups 8000 products monthly in other words that is after cleaning the data or after the data preparation that is about 1.5 million transactions guys okay so we'll try to understand what we mean by cleaning in a bit and the objective of the retail is to reduce their inventory costs and increase the efficiency of uh, supply chain. That, that has been their constant uh, objective and constant challenge also um, in trying to increase their efficiency of the supply chain. They, they, they are creating, or in other words, more precisely, back to Lucy. Lucy is creating forecasts constantly to create the right products, to have the right products at the right stores at the right time. If you need a hammer, don't sell a screwdriver. If you need a screwdriver, don't sell a hammer. 
In other words, more precisely, having the right product at the right time at the right store is more important. At some stores, they might be selling more hammers than screwdrivers. So we somehow need to need to strategize and uh, sell uh, supply more of hammers in, in that particular stores, guys. OK, so they also in other words, uh, back to Lucy. Lucy uses predictive analytics to create the models for each product and understand. She uses a combination of regression, classification, and time series models for forecasting, guys. Okay, models help uh, buy right products in large quantity at higher discounts. Not only are they using the predictive models to understand the right products at right stores, but also in acquiring the right products um, in sufficient quantity or more precisely in large quantities at an early point of time at a higher discounts and thereby reducing their costs, guys, OK? Segmented analysis is used to analyze sales at different stores. This helps in building, in the decision making to build new distribution centers at right stores. There might be some stores which are selling hammers and screwdrivers more and not any other items, not computers, not cell phones. So a distribution center with such items uh, closer to such stores would be more uh, helpful, more useful for the organization, guys. OK, it also helps to predict which product best sells in which stores. Again, it's the same point. If a store is particularly known for selling more computers or more mobile phones, then uh, it is not only good, it is very, very useful to understand uh, to uh, that kind of patterns is what it is, guys. OK, uh, moving ahead, it also you it is also useful um, in other words, the predictions are useful for creating forecasting. The forecasting is done for stock replenishment, pricing and promotion, sales and purchase planning also. Okay. It helps to have the right products at the right distribution centers to maximize the supply chain value. In other words, more precisely, the objective of finding such kind of patterns is to maximize the supply chain value or increase the efficiency of the supply chain. They create about 500, more precisely, Lucy creates about 500 predictive models per month in trying to come up with these kinds of uh, uh, understanding the patterns and forecasts. It helps keep pace with the changes in the market and demands, uh, and more precisely, customer demands. The market is an ever-changing place, and it is not easy to understand the changes in the market. And uh, the demands of the customers change based on many uh, things based on the season, based on the weather, based on many other uh, activities which are happening around, guys. Okay, so the combination of the right discounts and uh, supply chain efficiency allows for better decisions and maximizing the supply chain value, which is uh, the objective of predict creating all these predictive models. Uh, uh, is one of the main objectives. Also, the predictive models also help in meeting the KPIs, the key performance indicators which is one of them is optimize the supply chain, increase their accuracy in sales forecast. Traditionally, they've been having a very, very um, less forecast. So somehow increasing their forecast has been has become one of their KPIs, creating a large number of models to cover multiple business use cases. In other words, again, one more time, about 500 models a month are being built and uh, building a model, a final production model behind the scenes will take a lot of effort and time, guys, OK? I think somebody has unmuted. OK. OK, so the traditional process, um, in, uh, I'm sure some of you are uh, familiar with the script, uh, I'm sorry, the CRISP uh, uh, methodology and uh, the big data and things like that. The traditionally, these are some of the steps. We will briefly talk about these steps right from the business problem to the business outcome, guys. OK, so my intention here is to introduce a little bit of big data and present you some areas where you could dig into and probably try to think from a research perspective and uh, be able to help uh, the companies uh, in real world in real time so that your research is not really an academic work and uh, does not just sit there, but it actually maps to real world use cases and be able to uh, use that in a real world and be able to work more close uh, with the real world guys. OK, so I'm going to give a try. Um, here. Um, so that is a context. So that is a, a story so far. In other words, that's a retail organization 
and more precisely the objective is increasing the efficiency of the supply chain value and uh, um, is one of the main objectives guys okay with that what is happening today across multiple domains is there is a lot of data and the data is coming from many sources sorry sorry uh, navin yeah yeah your screen i think somebody has already did this so can you just present it again just oh. resume that thing again oh yeah Najia was the person. Yeah. Can you just resume that uh, where you have a present now option? Can you see the uh, resume now? I'm just okay. Yes, yeah, it now. Yes, yeah. Just resume now there. Okay. Do you see it now? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that, guys. So a moment back, that's where I was. I was uh, briefly referring to the CRISP uh, uh, methodology, and also I was about to present a little bit about the big data. That was the uh, screen that I was uh, talking about. Hopefully, uh, you all got an idea of that. And this is where I was introducing uh, the big data. The primary purpose to today in the real world, what is happening is uh, we are getting a lot of data. And uh, we have multiple sources today. Earlier, it, it used to be only the database data that we used to analyze, the data in the database and the data warehouse. But today, we have the data in the form of enterprise applications, so, which is nothing but traditionally the databases and the data warehouses. Then we have a lot of unstructured data coming from documents, sensors, machines, sensors and machines, social media, videos, and so on. And uh, we have data coming from all databases, complex IT environments. There is different varieties of the data. And uh, what the business really wants to do is they want to create meaning of the data. In order to achieve that, there are three things that we are trying to constantly, there are three patterns that we are constantly trying to address, which is the three A's, which is acquire the data, analyze the data, act the data, uh, and then be able to act on the data. If you're able to just acquire and analyze the data, but you're not able to and act on it, then it might not be very, very useful. OK, so in other words, more precisely, our enterprise applications, our data, which is coming from the different sources, is ending up being very, very huge, which is generally traditionally referred as big data. And the meaning we would like to create out of that is be able to understand the customer demands, be able to understand the uh, sentiment of uh, the customers and in many other forms, be able to do something like a fraud detection proactively predict when certain equipments require the uh, maintenance and a lot of optimization avenues exist in the world of supply chain guys okay so that is what these are the things these are the use cases that we are traditionally uh, working on in trying to and uh, convert the raw big data into meaningful insights for the for the real world guys okay so a quick touch of big data uh, some of you may already have an idea, but I'm just going to um, go uh, over this uh, little quick here. It is a term applied to data sets whose size is beyond the ability of commonly used software tools to capture, manage, and process the data within a tolerable amount of elapsed time. In other words, big data, traditionally people would think, uh, data when it is, imagine you have 100 terabytes of data or maybe one petabyte of data. Obviously, it would not fit on a single server. So that is then in such a case that could be referred as big data, which is which is which is true. But uh, most of the times, uh, or in other words, there are many times we come across scenarios where we have as little as one GB of data. But what happens is processing on a single server on or on multiple servers takes ten hours because of the mathematical complications, uh, um, you know, mathematical uh, stuff, or because of many other complex calculations going on uh, in in the in the algorithms guys okay in such a case where we need the processing to be done in one minute or maybe one hour it ends up taking 10 hours or 20 hours what's happening we are now being limited or we are now not being able to process that amount of data in a tolerable amount of elapsed time the size of the data is small but the processing is big it's taking more time than the time we require or we have in such cases even that small amount of data is referred as big data 
the three characteristics of the big data is the volume, velocity, and variety. And uh, what do the, these characteristics say? The, the three characteristics, as the volume increases, the complexity increases, the complexity of storing the data and processing the data. As the velocity increases, the, the complexity increases, and there is a lot of variety of data. The variety of the data is you go to Facebook, you have the data in the form of XML, you go to Twitter, you have the data in the form of JSON. Traditionally, companies were just going to the database and data warehouse and they would traditionally generate the reports. But today, they are going to different sources and these different sources are, the, uh, the internet is becoming the different source which is presenting multiple varieties of data due to which the complexity is increasing, guys, okay? So what do we do? The three uh, patterns we generally come across is acquire the data, analyze the data, and act on it. The, if we go into the use cases of these things at a low level, what we are really doing when we do, when we are acquiring the data is where the process of principles of ETL, which is extract, transform, and load come into the picture. Not only do we have big data, which is the batch data, but we also uh, have the uh, streaming data, which is coming in, which has its own uh, challenges in uh, in saving, in staging, and in uh, being able to come up uh, producing insights from that. That is another uh, way we are acquiring the data. Once we get the data, we are analyzing it. Even when you analyze it, you try to understand which are the uh, best ways of storing the data so that when we actually try to perform some advanced uh, analytics using the machine learning algorithms and things like that you know, to get the business insights, um, it, it will it it was uh, the process or the performance is at uh, at its best. In other words, um, acting is where where we are applying the machine learning algorithms after you arrange your data, after you store your data in an efficient manner, so that something which can be done in one hour would not take ten hours. If you would not arrange the data in an efficient manner, something which would take which would uh, take you know. A short amount of time may take long, uh, large amount of time. So that that is what uh, the acquire, analyze, and act is about. And uh, traditionally, in, a, in the from a real world perspective, almost all the companies are trying to look at multiple platforms for storing the big data. Once you store the big data, we are trying to uh, do the big data analytics on this one, where we are trying to look at multiple sources of the data, multiple varieties of the data and we are trying to understand what are the efficient ways of storing the data. Then comes the data science services where we are trying to find meaningful business insights from the data. These are generally at a high level the solution that we, are try, uh, we try to follow. Um, back to big data, again, um, it is an exponential volume of data. There was five exabytes of information which was created between the dawn of civilization through 2003, which refers to if we take all the data that uh, for the past 2,000 years, the entire mankind has been creating. And you were to digitize it, it, you, it, would, it would be around five exabytes of data. But the problem today is we are creating that amount of data every two days. Twitter processes 340 million messages weekly, which means if you try to store 340 million messages in, in a week in, into your database, that is the amount of data traditionally organizations or enterprises were accumulating or acquiring over years of time, but that is happening in a week or two weeks. Facebook generates about 2.7 billion likes. Amazon is 1 billion. eBay is 90 petabytes. And enterprise is moving towards not just terabytes and petabytes, but exabytes and zettabytes, guys. Okay. To be more precise, we are today, most of the time, we are working at a terabyte scale, which itself has its own challenges. But that is uh, where. Um, we can we can come up with a platform for big data. Sorry again, Naveen. Uh, I think your screen is not not coming again. Can you just check it once again? Okay. Yeah, only your uh, video is visible actually. Oh, okay. you are visible. Let's share it, uh, Sandeep. Can you see the screen? Do you see the screen, uh, Sandeep? Yes. 
okay great yes, thank sir. you sorry yes, but i don't you. know why that is happening but uh, this is where uh, uh, briefly a, a platform of, for the big data is where uh, we know that there's a lot of data and the fundamental or the first thing or the foremost thing that we need to do is we need to store the data by the platform for the data we need infrastructure and what kind of infrastructure traditionally this is where in real world we are kind of uh, we do not have a, a standard or uh, uh, in other words, most of the time, architects and things like that, they, we are randomly going ahead and choosing something uh, in, in a slightly random way. And that is, that is where a little bit of scope, uh, not a little bit of scope, but a good good amount of scope is there for good research where we can come up with uh, standard infrastructures, where we could propose standard infrastructures, come up with uh, different comparisons um, in, pro in providing the infrastructure, what is the right infrastructure for storing different kinds of data. Uh, accessing the data from any other data source. Accessing the data is once you store the data, we need to access the data. There are many ways of accessing the data, and that is where, again, a standard needs to be established uh, for accessing the data. Could, sir, could one of you um, mute yourself, please? It looks like. OK. Uh, all the data stores benefit from the in-memory performance. So today, if you, uh, I'm sure some of you heard about the Spark and things like that, the the new kid in the block, it is uh, it is allowing us to come up with uh, in-memory uh, computing, where uh, while the Hadoop is being used uh, for uh, storing the data, Spark is pro proposing um, us to uh, do what is called the in-memory computing. Uh, um, so in other words, um, all the way, uh, the, the performance of the processing would be much more higher. So that is also another uh, place where we can go ahead and um, dig a little bit deep into it and uh, try to uh, come up with ways of uh, uh, doing some research. But on the right hand side, what I'm trying to really uh, kind of uh, uh, convey uh, is what I would be talking in the coming up slides. So we have at the uh, base level, we have Hadoop mass data store, which is nothing but the big data, then the streaming analytics data, then the near real time data, which is near, nothing but the near uh, line store is what is referred. We take all the data traditionally, we would take the data, we would perform advanced machine learning algorithms, uh, which is the advanced analytics part of it. But today, a new proposition of the in-memory computing is presenting some new solutions, which is making the big data processing very, very uh, fast, uh, uh, fast, uh, guys, OK? So um, again, the main challenges of the big data is how do you store that amount of data, which is um, uh, referred generally referred as distributed storage. And uh, if you think distributed storage is complex, distributed processing is super complex. Um, so in other words, the bottom line, the, if you cannot store, you cannot retrieve. If you cannot retrieve, you cannot uh, process. If you cannot process, you cannot analyze. If you cannot analyze, you cannot uh, get the business insights. That is one of the main challenges of the big data. So some of the uh, things, some of the main use cases in the world of big data that we are trying to um, address is audience discovery, account intelligence, sentiment intelligence. I will be touching a few of them in the coming up slides here. Uh, but at a high level, these are the use cases. And uh, we, uh, the objective being making the big data uh, into um, getting the insights from the big data in such a way they are actionable. Not just get the insights and have them there in a static manner, but being able to apply them is, is, is uh, much more important, uh, is what it is, uh, folks. Okay. So that's where, again, traditionally, Hadoop has been coming to a rescue from our distributed storage perspective. And it allows us to, it's an open source uh, data management. And uh, this is where a lot of companies are in a random way uh, storing a lot of data. And uh, there, there's a good scope for uh, standardizing this one. There, there's a good scope for, um, um, uh, for different kinds of data, how you uh, store. Um, although there are some solutions available. But uh, uh, what I'm trying to convey here is it's, uh, it is really the distributed uh, storage platform. Um, and uh, a little, going a little deep into uh, the world of big data insights and things like that, here is an example of National Center for Tumor Diseases. They're part of the German Cancer Research Center and uh, Heidelberg University Hospital. Their objective is to start treatment of cancer patients by establishing a protocol on day one 
that is tailored to the specific genetic profile, which means the hospital traditionally used to collect the data and they used to pass it over to their IT team. They were never analyzing the data, but they always wanted to analyze the data. They want to collect the data. They also want to analyze the data. The way they would cater to their patients is uh, what is called a, a global solution. For every cancer patient, they would have one solution. And uh, what they would like to do is they would like to generate ideas for the future trials based on the analysis of the patient attributes. In other words, the analysis was separate from the actual hospital that was separately being done. And as a result of that, they were not really uh, uh, producing or in other words, they were not able to create, come up with new solutions which would help them in analyzing their patients and understanding their patients well. Extracting biomarker data from patients, evaluation letters, in other words, more data, more unstructured data. So their objectives, these were their objectives that they always wish for. That is where the big data analytics came to their rescue. Today, they're able to uh, do a real-time identification of cancer types to enable grouping of patients by relevant characteristics. In other words, more precisely, today what they're able to do is they're not able to uh, not only collecting the data but analyzing the data. They collect for every patient about 1,200 data points and now they're not going to their IT team. They have their own separate big data analytics team which is uh, analyzing this 1,200 data points. And what are they able to do? They were able to provide what is called personalized medicine to only 5% of the patients right from day one. Today, as a result of the collecting the data and being able to analyze the data, they're able to provide what is called personalized medicine right from day one for, to the 100% of the patients, folks, okay? So detailed view of previous treatment activities, including diagnosis, chemotherapy, surgery, and home visits. What that means is today, they have a view of any patient and every patient, not only at a personal level, but at a global level, which is allowing them to understand much more than what uh, they, they were uh, having an idea earlier. Real-time visibility into current upcoming clinical trials to match patients for part participation based on profile data and treatment needs. In other words, they have a real-time visibility and an understanding of how a patient is doing and things like that, and they're able to cater, uh, to a, uh, cater a patient to a patient at a personal level is some of the benefits that they have achieved. So a few more examples, just a couple of more examples here. Uh, improving the quality. So that is at an individual level. When we are talking about a patient, it's at an individual level, but at a community level also big data analytics is coming to our rescue. Uh, if you take the city of Boston, the, the, it, uh, it helped them in improving the quality of life with better city services. Uh, which means, again, the objectives uh, of uh, uh, Boston uh, city were to improve the quality of services to the residents, better align the city's actions and resources to established objectives. In other words, whatever the officials were doing, they wanted to give transparency to the public so that the public understand that they are acting in their interest and not in their uh, own personal interest and they were solving the problems of the public, which is what they were meant for. Better analytics, especially for the management of building permits and licensing, and uh, use big data analytics to fight crime. So in other words, more precisely, they were trying, they, 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 these were their objectives. They had a lot of data. And what happened? Well, that's when they started using big data. And today, Boston is much more safer, much more cleaner, and much more productive. How? They have 55% less crime in targeted locations. In other words, big data analytics, when they took the big data, they started performing the analytics and the advanced analytics using the machine learning and the advanced uh, algorithms, some of the correlations they ended up finding were in, in places where there were no street lights, more crime was happening. In other words, they found some hidden patterns or hidden correlations, which indicated the crime was high where the street lights were low. So as a result of that, plugging in more street lights, the crime reduced. Okay, less than 10 overdue city permits reduced from 600 their ability to process the city permits, permissions and things like that reduced from 600 to 10. 66% reduction in calls regarding problem properties. So in other words, as they were analyzing the data, when they, um, they there are ways, there are, um, there are techniques where we can understand which are the 
problems which are applicable at a global scope, where if we solve one problem, it would help multiple people. So in reprioritizing which are the most impo more important problems versus less important problems, as a result of that, a lot of reduction in calls, uh, uh, calls has uh, happened. 2,000 unique KPIs being delivered via mobile and online. Uh, the KPIs, the key performance indicators, not only to the uh, officials, but also to the public indicating, hey, these are the things that we are doing. They have discovered many key performance indicators uh, by using the big data analytics uh, folks, okay? So uh, another example is eBay, again, one of the world's largest uh, marketplace for selling and sellers and buyers, uh, signal detection. To be able to uh, identify what uh, a customer is interested in, what a particular customer is selling in, uh, to be able to predict the right uh, patterns, Okay, sorry about that. Um, is one of the main objectives. Again, um, if I were to quickly focus on the objectives here, ability to separate signals from the noise to identify key changes to the health of eBay's. What is signal versus noise? Signal is a pattern, is a useful pattern that would be helpful to the customers and uh, the businesses. Uh, so we need to understand what is useful versus what is not useful. Um, improve predictability and forecast confidence of eBay's virtual economy. So in other words, a lot of forecasting. Businesses need a lot of forecasting, not just on a periodic basis, but almost on a daily uh, basis. That is where, uh, that is one of the main objectives of eBay. Increase the insights into deviations and their causes. Many times we're interested in finding the root causes of many things. And uh, that, that ends up being a complex process where the traditional BI fails to achieve it, guys, okay? So, um, so here are the results, so automated signal detection system that can automatically select the best models. In other words, using big data analytics and performing advanced analytics, they were able to build an automated signal detection system, which helps them in tracing out what are the right signals. Signals are nothing but something. There are some trends which are happening, trends, something different from a trend. When there is a deviation from a trend, uh, what happens, that is referred as signal. Something is about to happen, it might be a good thing, it might be a bad thing, you take stocks. A deviation from a trend might uh, mean that a stock is going down. A deviation from a uh, particular trend may mean that the uh, stock price may uh, go up. So that, that kind of signals is what uh, they were interested in. And these help in understanding the patterns of the customers and be able to help the customers more. Uh, uh, in other words, the the, what I'm trying to convey here is, again, the hidden patterns and the forecast is what they were interested. So back to the uh, big data storage, you acquire, we accelerate, and uh, uh, you uh, analyze and apply. In other words, at the time of acquiring, we do the consu consuming and processing. We consume the data, that is the storage layer. Once you store the data, there are different ways in which you can accelerate the process. You have different kinds of data. So we have unstructured data, which is a textual or the social media data. Then we have the spatial data. We have the graph-like data. So what needs to be done is today we get the data, we dump the data in something like a Hadoop and just leave it there. Sometimes we use the uh, Hive. Sometimes we use the NoSQL databases and things like that. But uh, a lot of uh, scope is, this is where a lot of scope is there in, uh, in, in kind of coming up with different kinds of benchmarks where specifically for spatial data, Specific, specifically for graph-like data. Uh, what are the specific techniques that we can use? Um, um, the, 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 uh, in other words, personally, I see a lot of scope that uh, this is where academicians can come in and uh, uh, give us, uh, you know, help us uh, in understanding uh, so that we don't have to randomly uh, grope uh, and try to find uh, the techniques randomly, guys, okay? So once we are able to efficiently store the data in the right formats, in the right uh, uh, ways, then we can per perform the advanced visualizations in the predictive analytics. That is upper layer is what uh, I have uh, here. That, so that is how the, at a high level, the storage and the compute platform looks like. Hadoop I have talked about, it is primarily a big data analytics framework. It uses a lot of cheap servers. It is generally referred as a distributed storage layer. Also it is used for distributed processing guys. Okay, since I talked about it, about it I'm going to make a little progress here. Then we have the hot data on the left-hand side, then we have the cold data on the right-hand side. In the middle, we have what is called warm data. Hot data is a uh, high-frequency uh, data. 
you take um, domains like uh, stock trading, forex trading, and things like that. These are high frequency. In about a few, uh, in about less than second, lot of uh, data comes in, and that kind of data needs to be analyzed at that point of time to be may uh, to be able to make useful decisions. Cold data is where you acquire the data, you store the data, then at a periodic, maybe 15 days, maybe the 30 days, it's okay to analyze the data at that point of time and be able to come up with insights. Now, something where which is neither, where we don't have a very high requirement of real-time nor, or in other words, something which falls in between, these two is referred as a warm data. This is where also <clears throat> a scope for uh, uh, looking for further techniques. We have very few techniques that we generally take them for granted and we live with that. But this is where we can come up with lots of different ways and investigate what are the best ways to handle, store, process, and analyze the different kinds of hot data versus warm data and cold, cold data. More, more chance or more scope for research exists here, guys. Okay. Uh, the data acquisition options, um, what we do is you acquire the data. The data is coming in the form of geolocation, which is the geographical data, which is like the latitudes, longitude. There's a lot of sensor data, which is coming from different kinds of uh, machines. Um, the machine generated data, these are all the different data. What do we do? You acquire. How, what currently, again, the way you acquire, that is where a scope uh, for uh, research exists. Uh, for each one, specific kind of method, rather than a global method. Uh, would be a useful area to look into. What is a, uh, for a ge uh, geographical data, so what is a good way to store versus what is sensor data? Right now, a global uh, method exists, would be my take on that. Um, so landscape transformation. So once you get the raw data, how you transform it? And if it is streaming data, how do you go ahead and transform? Should you store? Should you not store? What do you store? How do you store? That is accessing. That is called smart accessing. And uh, how do you integrate it? These are some of the areas where I, I can uh, suggest uh, um, uh, for uh, looking into for some research aspects. And uh, uh, today, um, we are using the solutions more precisely, whether, whether there is one solution or whether there are multiple solutions, it is being used in a random way. And this is where, again, a scope exists where, there, where you guys can uh, think of some standardized ways um, and create a, a, a um, and come up with some ideas um, where we can follow a solution. We can have a solution for uh, uh, achieving all these things. How do you integrate the data? What are the good quality techniques? What are the uh, processing or the pre-processing techniques? What are the good servers from a hardware perspective? What would be a good design environment? What is a uh, what would a good administration uh, console to monitor? Look uh, looks like this is where. Uh, more scope exists, although there are some um, techniques and tools available, but a lot of scope exists would be my take on that. Then the landscape transformation is really data transformation. When you store the data, when we acquire the big data, should we, is, 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 is all the data necessary to replicate? Should we replicate? Is real-time data really necessary? Or is it just used for staging um, is one thing. Uh, we can think there are different uh, possible scenarios which exist there. And for each scenario, we could uh, kind of, you know, look into it and see if we, if we can um, come up with a standardized way again, the different ways of transforming the data, uh, making the sensitive data anonymous. Again, that's a very random standard today, how we sensitive, how, the, how we anonymize the sensitive data. The sensitive data includes some uh, uh, information such as maybe you know, uh, for us, something like Aadhaar ID cards in US, it is like the social security numbers and things like that, guys. Okay, so this is where we can actually uh, put a little bit of thought and uh, map our ideas and see if we can come up with any ways which are with, uh, which would be useful for real world and continue to do the research. Streaming data again, the complex event processing. Most of the times, the complex event processing refers to this streaming data which is generally the data, small amounts of data which comes in. Imagine the stocks. Um, every minute, uh, there's uh, data coming in. Every few seconds, actually, it's possible for us to fetch the data. And uh, there are a few signals you want to uh, process. So in other words, you get the data. Sometimes it may not be necessary to store the data. It might be stock data. It might be temperature data of the sensors. You're getting the temperature data from different sensors. And what do you do? You don't need to store every record. but there are some times where the temperature is unusual. 
and such times you want to store it. So in other words, there's some complex uh, processing you may need to do on this streams of data. You may want to apply some machine learning algorithms and understand that these are the outliers. These temperatures indicate uh, that there is some condition and a lot of scope exists. We can reverse engineer and things like that. Uh, I'll probably talk about that in a, in a slide or two. But that is uh, generally the complex event processing. Most of the times, even uh, complex events are not really stored. They are staged and uh, they're continuously analyzed only when they, re, uh, you know, when they come up with certain, meet certain conditions, that's when they are stored. So that is a little bit about the uh, streaming data. How do you access the data? Once we get the big data or the streaming data, what are the good ways to access the data? The tools such as Hadoop and Spark do provide us, but there is more scope for uh, going ahead and uh, extracting some scenarios, looking at some specific scenarios and being able to understand what are the best ways to access the data. What we are following today is very general way of accessing the data, but that's where a little bit of study and research could be done in coming up with more ideas in accessing these data, guys, okay? And the demand signal management, um, this is nothing but being able to build models. You take the historical data and being able to build the models in understanding the supply and demand, um, you know, you know, able to forecast the supply and demand and uh, being able to spot the market trends and the deviations and things like that. In other words, this, be, this is where, again, we could use a lot of modeling data with the historical data. And again, the fraud management, uh, being able to detect, uh, to be able to build the de uh, fraud detection rules is very manual and it may not always be helpful. In such cases, uh, big data comes to a rescue where we take uh, one more time again, we take the historical data, we try to uh, build the modeling uh, we, we try to come up with different models and uh, they will help us in detecting which is a fraud versus which is not a fraud. Um, so so it is not always possible for us to uh, define the fraud uh, detection strategies and uh, that is where um, we could, we could uh, fall back to the data and there's a lot of scope for optimization. Um, executing mass and real-time detection and stop suspicious uh, business transaction. In other words, again, the gist is, again, trying to understand which business transaction. You might sometimes get a call in real world they were, uh, from your credit card saying that, hey, uh, have you made a, a transaction on your credit card? This looks like a, a fra fraud or things like that. So they are trying to just verify if the transaction is the right one or a fraud one. And uh, that's where big data analytics uh, can come to our, our rescue. So we can also monitor uh, the number of events which are happening. So you detect, you investigate, you analyze, and how you design, which is a fraud detection rule. Um, uh, th this is generally the process we, uh, we follow and we try to look into it, guys, okay? So a little bit about the retail value driver tree is trying to understand the root causes. Um, in other words, uh, the ro root cause analysis of certain events. Suddenly, imagine a Pepsi and a Coke. Uh, one of our clients, what happens is sometimes they, they, they observe a few patterns where uh, although Pepsi and Coke are uh, most of the time similar in sales, some days, certain days, the sales of Pepsi go, uh, go up very high and the Coke doesn't get sold. Now, what they would like to understand is what is the reason or what is the cause? That is what is value driver tree. You may want to go from top to bottom or bottom to top. That is the value driver tree. Sometimes people who buy bread may, buy, may purchase milk. Could one of you mute yourself, please? OK. So the affinity insight is where, where generally the customers who are interested in uh, who purchase bread may purchase milk or butter. but. Being able to understand patterns that customers who are purchase, purchasing. Okay. There are some customers who purchase diapers, they end up buying beer. Being able to understand hidden patterns like that is very, very valuable. It helps the companies. Are you able to mute the? We have removed him, sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
So affinity insight is uh, where we perform the market basket analysis and try to understand some uh, some interesting, rather super interesting patterns, which are extremely valuable in promotion, pricing, and placement strategies uh, uh, for the companies and organizations. These could be taken as individual uh, individual case studies, and uh, we can dig a little bit into these things, and uh, we, we we could uh, kind of uh, uh, apply these kind uh, these kinds of techniques in many other domains, not just in the retail domain, um, especially the market bas basket analysis seems to be very, very um, useful in real world. Uh, key item list is the top items and things like that. So these are some of the uh, things in which, uh, big, um, or in other words, the products of big data analytics. Then comes the predictive maintenance and the service. Um, I will not read out the entire thing here, but uh, more precisely, predictive maintenance is a process where the traditional process is uh, there's a lot of uh, utility companies, the power, uh, for example, the power, they have a lot of infrastructure around the cities, around the states, and around the country. The traditional way of approach of taking care of the things is if there is a problem in a particular equipment, once the equipment fails, they'll go, they'll go ahead and fix it. But what can happen is it takes a lot of time. And uh, if there is somehow, rather than reacting to this one, if we can proactively identify an equipment or a part of an equipment which is about to fail, then that would be more helpful or more useful. That is where the predictive analytics can come to our rescue. And that's where we could take a lot of historical data, build models, and try to um, take the data of the sensors and be able to predict which equipment or the part is about to fail and proactively take care of that. As a result of that, predictive maintenance saves a lot of money. And uh, so in other words, that's a, that's a, a use case. Uh, again, I'm, I'm talking about it. I, I know you guys are more interested in specific areas of research and things like that. Um, so, so in other words, uh, why I'm presenting multiple use cases from a general perspective is I would like you guys to think, um, uh, if pick up any of these use cases or any of these things and be able to map your ideas into any of these things and see if you can dig a little bit deep and uh, come up with your own ideas. Uh, and research into them. That would be, if you're able to achieve a little bit of success, you 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 would be directly be able to contribute a lot to the uh, real world. Uh, is my opinion, guys. Okay. So again, in logistics and manufacturing, we have different kinds of data, all unstructured data, the geospatial data, events, and many other kinds of data. The objective, the different kinds of things that we could do is uh, in overall equipment effectiveness energy management, optimizations. These are some of the things that we strive to achieve generally from this kind of unstructured data. The traditional process, uh, all these kind of things have been have been uh, done using structured data. But today, unstructured data. Statistically, we know um, if you have, if you already, some of you may already have heard that 80 to 90% of the data that the organizations today, they have or they collect is unstructured data. So there's a lot of scope how from unstructured data we can achieve, we can uh, get the business insights which will give us, uh, which will help us in solving uh, these things would be uh, my take on that, guys, okay? So then comes the data science. Data science is generally referred as advanced analytics. The big data analytics focuses more on the data engineering part of it. But once you engineer the data, once you have your data, uh, accessible in a very efficient and a performant manner. That's where you, you we, we try to perform some advanced analytics, which is the uh, using the machine learning techniques, guys. Okay, data mining. Traditionally, the business intelligence has been restricted to standard reporting and ad hoc analysis. But uh, today, data mining, which is uh, um, um, which is nothing but the machine learning, is the allowing us to perform advanced mathematics on the data that we have and uh, be able to uh, understand advanced insights or more hidden unknown insights in the data is what the data mining and the modeling is about. So here is an example uh, where the data science uh, looks deeper. Uh, in a, a retail store, imagine there's a coffee um, or imagine a Starbucks coffee. They are selling two products. One is, let's say, a flavor A and a flavor B, uh, maybe a cappuccino and maybe a frappe. And uh, 
what they do is uh, they are observing how the sales are going after six weeks. It looks like product A, maybe more cappuccino is being sold rather than um, or, or more than frappe. But uh, so one may think or Starbucks may think that uh, uh, cappuccino is more of a successful product than frappe guys. Okay. But uh, looking a little bit deep into it, it may be uh, possible uh, that uh, more than cappuccino, which is product A, the product B, the more repeat purchases are happening. What it means is when, when the products were introduced new, it looked like more people were ordering A rather than B, but uh, looking more deeper into it, we understand more of these being ordered, reordered, the purchase is repeating, which means it's not product A which is more successful, it is product B which is more successful. From what it looks like, or for, from what I may sound like, that might be something simple to you. But that kind of patterns could be applied to lots or every every possible product or all the possible combinations of products. And lots of strategic uh, or lots of useful decisions could be taken, which are useful for um, uh, promotional, promotional pricing and uh, especially promotional pricing guys okay so that is an example another example is again in the world of uh, supply chain oil gas airlines they have a lot of uh, infrastructure the midline indicates the reorder point they have a lot of infrastructure reparts uh, parts and things like that and they are constantly purchasing acquiring lots of inventories and or, or uh, accumulating the inventories of these parts so here we have there's one global plomb point which is a mid yellow dashed line where whenever a particular or any parts um, they uh, they reach this point they're reordering but what could be done using the data science or the forecasting techniques is we can take the historical data build a model a model and the models uh, can indicate that all the locations all the parts may not or need not have the same reorder point at some locations, some parts may have much more lesser point or they don't even need to be reordered, which means it will save a lot of cost for the companies and things like that. So um, so those are the kinds of useful things because well, when I say I'm saying at a particular part level, but these are the principles which are applied globally across at their, you know, are, are at all the parts that they have and that really becomes very, very valuable uh, for the companies. Guys, another example is media, imagine newspapers. They are, uh, they are uh, supplying the newspapers to different locations, A and B, for example. And generally, they have a constant safety stock, a constant benchmark for safety stock. But that's a traditional process. But build the models. And what the models may suggest is there might be some areas where the safety stock might be much lesser for certain areas. So in other words, um, you know, so, uh, location A may need more number of uh, copies or you know um, newspapers as uh, uh, compared to B at different points of time it might be based on the weather it might be based on the uh, events certain events festivals and things like that so that kind of insights were never possible and today because of the data and more precisely big data big data we're able to uh, take our data to that extent guys another final example is utilities again back to utilities there are lots of cables lots of center sensors millions and millions of sensors are being plugged into various uh, equipment and infrastructures and they're generating ridiculous amount of data most of the times what happens is or a common problem that we generally see in real world is some of the sensors don't produce data to be able to go to these millions of sensors and look back and try to understand why they are not generating the data that they should be generating becomes very, very problematic. It almost becomes impossible because of the scale of the sensors or because of the number of sensors and things like that, guys, okay? So in such cases, we can take the data that the existing sensors have produced. We can use, we can build models, use optimization techniques and impute the missing data. And based on the understanding of the missing data, we can reverse engineer and understand why the sensors have failed. That is a very, very powerful thing which could be used by utilities, guys, okay? So in other words, these are some of the use cases how, uh, where, uh, 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 which, which come under the 
uh, big data analytics traditionally whenever we, we we work on the big data projects these are generally the uh, timelines uh, and the process that we follow we started we come up with some innovative sessions that is where a lot of interaction with the clients happen then uh, we try to um, you know think think in terms we try to map our technical concepts into the business concepts that's the advisory part and we try to advise the uh, clients then we try to come up with a proof of concept once the proof of concept is uh, accepted we, uh, we develop a, a complete high level architecture and a detailed low level architecture then we come up with the um, we try to deliver the project and uh, this goes on in a cycle uh, in, a, in an iterative manner is uh, i just wanted to give a touch of it there is also a lot of scope while, while you're working on the big data when you have the data would you rather store it on the cloud versus hybrid versus on premise right now not a lot of um, not a lot of um, um, a reference or not a lot of um, the direction is there is it better to store it on the cloud versus hybrid versus on on premise not a lot of benchmarks are there that's where a lot of scope can exist for geospatial data maybe it is better to store it on cloud for unstructured data such as textual data social mining maybe hybrid is better maybe for other kinds of data on premise data is uh, better maybe for structured data on premise uh, storing it on premise is better so in other words uh, not only are we storing from a deployment perspective a combination of all these things may, might be better we do not know that's where the scope for research exists so that's what i'm uh, kind of uh, briefly uh, have it uh, here on the left hand side i will not read out uh, all the points here but if i make a little bit progress the big thing unstructured data a lot of uh, scope uh, exists again lots of sentimental analysis and things like that guys okay so before so let me just uh, bring this up here it looks like we are almost at 6:30 here and uh, i got a bunch of slides i don't want to take off your time too much i know we are uh, here for about an hour or so so before going any further maybe sandeep uh, if you think it's a good idea i can take up a few questions and maybe um, make it yeah. more relevant please feel free to let me yeah know. that will be great so uh, thank you very much sir and uh, if if anyone has any questions maybe he or she can unmute himself and uh, many of the questions i have uh, i've seen in the chat window like they were requesting to share the ppts and all yeah and recording them so definitely we are going to send the ppts and the recording of the session and yeah. if, if somebody has any questions so uh, sir will Hello. Be, yeah i have one question sir regarding the, that i am doing phd sir uh, Can you introduce yourself like who you are because we are not able to yeah. from bangalore okay. i'm doing phd in in the big data analytics in healthcare domain sir whether we have to use any machine learning concepts definitely for this uh, uh, for this big data analytics sir definitely without using any machine learning concepts can we use can we perform any kind of research and uh, coding and uh, process in this uh, big data analytics sir um, sure uh, for data engineering uh, uh, for data engineering to be able to come up with innovative ways of how to store and an analyze the data uh, even before you feed it to the machine learning algorithms uh, there exists a lot of scope there if you're able to come up with some innovative ways machine learning is not a must there because uh, the, the 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 very way you are presenting the data itself has a lot of scope for improvement and you can definitely do that would be a short answer so can you can you give me an example in the healthcare data how we can perform uh, this this big data analytics and by using this performing research or anything but we will take the data sets to sir to perform mm -hmm. the research or anything so, so after taking the da data sets how we can um, go through how we can further uh, uh, have have a step to going through research sir okay giving an example would itself be a big solution honey but what i can suggest is the way i would suggest you proceed is you take the data you do a little bit of research on that kind of data how it is being processed currently and you try to understand if there are any possible benchmarks and see if you can apply a little bit of thought or and uh, uh, innovativity and uh, then try to propose a new solution uh what i i what i mean is uh if we take any data sets or anything so how uh, we have to select uh, the that one and uh, 
how we have to implement so since it is a distributed file system no sir how yeah. we can uh, uh, do perform the classification for example yeah. if, take, if i take any diabetes data if yeah. it is of type 1 data and type 2 type 2 di uh, diabetes and type 1 di diabetes is there okay so i have to classify the data no i have to classify the data so how i can perform the classification process Basically, I mean, the, the traditional modeling process is you take the historical data, you try to build a model. You have to have the right sample and the right uh, uh, right set of data to be able to build a good model. And, uh, uh, you know, your process of feature engineering will give you a good accuracy and things like that. You also have to test it on multiple models. But uh, how you, I mean, the process of feature engineering is probably where you could dig a little bit deep in trying to understand uh, in trying to come up with a good model. I, am I answering your question? Uh, a little bit, somewhat. Uh, okay. Uh, These yeah. Thank you very much, Madam. Yeah, I think uh, you can always send the bill to him. And yeah. he'll be happy to, I hope he'll be happy to answer your questions. Sir, can you share the PPTs and videos? Definitely, definitely Madam. Like, uh, we are going to share the recording as well as uh, PPTs of the session. So as, as soon as we receive from the speaker, we'll be sharing. So okay. now we'll take one more question. Ms. Madhvi, madam, is there? I think uh, she was asking that she will be. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, sir, Suman Bhattacharya, sir, is asking, like, what kind of software can be used for big data? Some examples. Hadoop and Spark are uh, the most popular analytics frameworks which are going around and which are being used by the organizations. So you can look into, you can start with them. Okay. So one yeah. more question from V. Ramakrishna sir, sir. Which is the best tool for analytic process? Um, there are there are there are many tools, um, um, such as uh, you know, for a, for a big data analytics framework, again Hadoop and Spark will become your reference tools. Whereas uh, from a slightly machine learning or a predictive analytics, Python, R, MATLAB, and uh, while well, Python is dominating today. Um, these are some of the tools from a machine learning perspective or a predictive analytics perspective. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. I just have a last last question. So, do you think that uh, the the people who are doing research in uh, big data analytics uh, should also know uh, this machine learning techniques uh, like classification, clustering, and depending upon their interest? So, do you think that? Uh, it, it's for men, it's for them mandatory to, you know, uh, it learn. Be, it will be extremely beneficial for them uh, okay. someday. Okay, right. So, thank you very much. And I think uh, still many questions are coming. So, I think due to uh, shortage of time, we, will, uh, we would like to conclude the session. And I will request my colleague, uh, Veer Kumar, to propose a vote of thanks. Veer? Yeah, thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. I, Veer Kumar, Assistant Professor, Department of CSC, Anurag University. I'm honored to have the opportunity to give out of thanks on this special day. It was very, it was really a very wonderful and informative session by our today's speaker, Mr. Pathuru Navin, Head of Data Science, reinforcedsci.com. Though he is very busy in his tight schedule, I accepted our request and spoke about how important big data research in computer science advancement. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Navin Garu. And I would like to thank our director, Dr. K. S. Rao, sir, and Dean Computer Science Engineering, Dr. Vijay Kumar, sir, for encouraging such events. I like to thank our deputy director and head of the department, Computer Science, Dr. Vishnumurthy, sir, for supporting and encouraging this webinar. I would like to thank Dr. Sandeep Rawat sir for conducting and hosting such a nice webinar. I must thank the organizing team and the faculty members who contributed in organizing this webinar. Finally, I would like to thank all the participants for participating and making this webinar successful. Please, participate and share further webinars and programs from Anurag University. And lastly, everyone, please stay safe, take care, 
thank you thank you everyone thank you so much thank you veer and uh, thank you very much navin for your wonderful session and once thank again uh, from on behalf of adrag we thank you a lot yeah thank, thank you. you thank you navin sir thank you navin sir ramon kumar thank you yeah thank you ramna sir also yeah because of ramna thank you thank you uh, thank you sajib sir yeah thank you and uh, if you could uh, share the ppts uh, so that uh, we can sure. share with the uh, participants sure something so thank I you very you. much yeah thank you signing off yeah signing off thank thank you sir bye for yeah thank you others are also requested to leave the session it bombare feedback sir feedback form yeah we have shared the feedback form already so sir feedback form sent it means can we leave Yeah, yeah. Those who have already filled the feedback form, please check your mail. You will be getting the uh, certificate there. And uh, thank, thanks once again, everyone, for uh, for uh, being with us today. Because there was a lot of uh, a problem in the you know like uh, technical issues was coming. So thank you, everyone.